is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to episode 185 of the Rebel Author Podcast. Today, I'm talking to Katya from Midblood, and we're going to be discussing how to use your book cover for a marketing tool. But first to last week's question, which was, what aspect of book marketing do you find hardest to grasp? Heather replied saying, marketing struggles equal getting past my introvert self and actually making connections with people, which is, um, I get it, I understand it. Before I go to any conference, I'm usually outside chundering my guts up (laughs) because I'm so nervous. This week's question is, what is giving you life right now? It can be anything, anything random. It could be a game. It could be a book. It could be a TV show. It could be a place that you visit. It could be a person you've met. It could be a new friend. It could be a naughty grand. It could be food that you've tried and loved. Tell me what is giving you life right now. Book recommendation of the week this week is a patron book. So this week it is Ghosts from the Veil by Scott Williamson. This is a collection of short stories uh, set in Edinburgh, and this is how the blurb goes. Ghosts from Edinburgh's past haunt supernatural detective Hugh. Hugh would like nothing better than to be left alone, so he can drink his way through retirement and forget his own history. But the dead have problems he needs to solve, or the living will suffer the consequences. Can Hugh keep his temper, foul mouth and drinking in check long enough to unravel the puzzle of each ghost before they harm the living? The dead also want to help. Fanny Archibald, born in 1850 and brutally murdered in 1865, is back to provide her unwanted guidance to Hugh, as if dealing with the dead wasn't bad enough. Now, Hugh had the opinions of a 15-year-old to endure. Can Hugh and Fanny solve the riddle of each ghost and transfer the lost souls back across the veil to the land of the dead? Readers will love these five twisted ghost tales set in the historic city of Edinburgh. So if you like the sound of that, if you like detective stories, if you like a bit of humour and uh, a a little bit gore, I have read the stories in this one, if you like a little bit of uh, gore as well, then uh, this is the book for you and I highly recommend it. So go check it out. The links will be in the show notes. So in personal news and updates then, I wanted to let you all know if you haven't already seen the amazing news that Kobo Plus has now launched in the UK and US. If you don't know what Kobo Plus is, it is a all-you-can-eat subscription service, uh, a bit like other exclusive subscription services that will remain nameless, Uh, but this one is not exclusive. Yay for Kobo. So what is it? Okay, Subscribers will pay a flat fee to read and listen to unlimited books for as long as they are enrolled in the program. And we as authors and publishers are paid based on a revenue share model. And uh, you can find a breakdown of how the payment works. I will link to that in the show notes. So the uh, prices range from $7.99 in the US up to $9.99. And I think it's uh, the audiobooks and ebooks in the UK is $11.99. But if you go to their uh, announcement page, you'll be able to find all of the updates. I'm very excited. All of my wide books are, I've already clicked um, and told them that I want them to be added to their catalogue. So uh, if you read on Kobo, then you will be able to get all of my wide books, all of my non-fiction craft stuff uh, in their uh, Kobo Plus subscription service. I'm super excited for this because this just means more readers, more people for us to get access to and more opportunities. So I just, I love Kobo. You guys know I love Kobo. So I'm, I'm really excited for this. And I think that you guys should check it out too. So in personal news and updates then. This week has been strange for me because I haven't been writing and I feel like I've been drafting and writing forever. Uh, So it was quite nice to get the chance to go and do a lot of back-end tasks. I, with the fact that I am going to be releasing more regularly this year, I (laughs) realise... 
<laughs> that the absolute clusterfuck of chaos that I live in is perhaps not the best method for publishing multiple books in a year. So I have been systematizing everything. I've been creating spreadsheets, like a one document to rule them all. I've been creating like template uh, social media captions, template newsletters uh, for launches where I'm going to be including the same kinds of information every single time. Um, I've been including, uh, not including, I've been doing uh, more uh, like creating a set of promotional social media um, posts and things that can promote all of the stuff that I do. Because actually, um, <laughs> my coach made a really good point that once I've done something, like finished a project or a book or a course or whatever, it's dead to me. And I resented that because <laughs> I was like, how dare you be so uh, accurate? <laughs> To be perfectly honest, because it's true. I do finish a project and then it's gone. And I think that's really true of what I have been doing. Um, you know, with these launches, I launch and then I just leave it and get on with the next thing. But actually, I now have a backlist of nonfiction books. And, you know, if I'm being completely honest with you, with the focus having been on fiction in the last few months, the nonfiction has taken a bit of a tank in terms of sales. So, Actually, it's a good reminder. And the other thing that's reminded me is that not everybody listens to this podcast. Obviously, not everybody listens to it. But um, even people who follow me don't all listen to this podcast. And that um, has never been truer than me uh, sort of writing about the fact that I um, write, you know, being able to draft a book in, in, a, in less than a month on my newsletter and receiving quite a few emails asking how I was doing that and, and you know, uh, what was going on there. And that was a reminder to me that that actually we do have to uh, put the same information out on many different platforms because not everybody follows you everywhere. And it's, I did know that, I did know that, but I wasn't necessarily following through with that or doing anything about it. So I'm going to be a lot more strategic and a lot more tactical. And I am going to repeat information um, on different platforms to make sure that those messages get out there. And we all know that people need seven touches, right? It's the, the whole marketing seven touches before someone buys. And I haven't been doing that. And so I feel like I've not been making the most of my backlist. And when you speak to any author who has... I don't know, 20, 30 plus books, they all say that 50 to 70% of their um, income every year is from their backlist. Well, what the fuck am I doing? Like, I'm not doing anything to promote my backlist, really. Uh, so, and I do have 20 books now. So I think I do. I'm pretty sure I have more than that. I don't know. I don't know if they're all published. Some of them are not, I don't know. I have to go and count. Anyway, I'm very close to um, or around that figure. So for me, this now, this the rest of this year is about being a lot more tactical, a, a, regularly applying for like book buds and chirps and, you know, trying to maximise, run more sales. Like I don't really ever run sales. Like very, I do one occasionally on my birthday. I forgot to do it this year. So my mind in April, um, I think I mentioned this last time, but I'm, I've taken the whole of April off drafting so that I can uh, spend a little bit more time thinking and being a bit more strategic and tactical. And like I say, creating the, these systems uh, and putting them in place. So I, I'm really excited. I feel really good by the fact that I've created kind of, you know, several like standard captions that we can tweak each time uh, to promote all of my stuff. Because I do have a lot of stuff now. And um, I can't even remember the last time I mentioned that I have courses, you know, and if I'm going to create more in June, because I've sort of set June aside to, to create more courses, um, I, I should be capitalising on the fact that I've already got uh, courses. So yes, I am taking this month to be a lot... <laughs> I'm taking this month to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> Although it doesn't feel like I'm slowing down because I've done so much fucking work this week. It's unbelievable. But yes, I'm doing more strategic things. I'm trying to move to um, author mail. So that will be a new mailing list shift uh, just to lower the price, basically. Um, and then tweaking things in the back end, looking at where I can maximize my um, products and books and courses and things that I already have. So yes, today, later after I've done this podcast, I will be outlining book three because I'll be writing book three in May. Uh, but otherwise, I would say that the rest of this month is dedicated to, yeah, all that good back end systems stuff. Probably the next time I 
In fact, the next time I record, I'll have been to and come back from Seville, uh, the 20 books to 50k Seville conference. So if you're going, make sure to say hello. Although, like I say, <laughs> this will already, this will come out and I'll have already been there and back. But anyway, hopefully you come and say hi. Um, yeah, so I think that's kind of it. This month is itty bitty that's what it feels like because of the type of work that I'm doing but I'm enjoying it and it feels like I'm clearing a weight off my shoulders and just I don't know making the most of of what I've or yeah I don't know I've already said that but hope what I'm hoping is that this does increase sort of the backlist um sales and income and just gives everything a bit of a boost really uh because hey we did all of this work right <laughs> So we want it to sell. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Okay. The rebel of the week this week is P.T. Sand. I hope that's how you pronounce the surname. Uh, okay. P.T. says, I used to be a secondary school teacher. I taught mainly senior students, year 12, the last year of high school in Australia. One year, in what became the reason I am no longer a teacher, a female student, 17 years or so uh, old, uh, approached me and asked for help escaping an upcoming coerced arranged marriage overseas. I tried to redirect her to appropriate services, but she picked me as the adult she could trust. And we all know asking for help is hard and brave. So I decided to help her. I knew that helping her would put my job at risk, but I couldn't in good conscience turn her away. She got away for a while, but eventually her family found her and presumed, presumably took her home. And then the family went on to complain about me to the school who investigated and promptly fired me because, and I quote, I had put the 17 year old woman in danger who in Australia has the right to choose where and with whom she lives as a 17 year old. Obviously, I was not particularly happy about being fired, but I was even more annoyed that I was portrayed as the cause of the young woman being in danger. So I took the matter up with the government body for fair work in my state, got the sacking revoked and then promptly resigned from the school. Good for you. Uh, but the fun did not stop there. I was reported to the Australian Child and Youth Safety Government Body and investigated again, who of course found that I had not broken any laws in any way. When it came to renewing my teacher registration, I declared as required that I had been part of an investigation. So now my teacher renewal was in jeopardy while they did another investigation, which took almost a year. Oh my God. For every investigation, I happily answered all of their questions and gave them access to whatever they asked for. I was accused of being racist, which was quickly rescinded when I pointed out that my familial heritage was the same as the students. This was probably why she approached me for help in the first place. They also had, the, had made a range of other accusations which were simply untrue. After almost two years the whole, uh, since the whole saga started, during which I could continue to work in schools as a teacher like nothing was wrong, the teacher registration board, without meeting me in person or online or speaking to me on the phone, decide, oh, decided that I was a danger to children and no longer allowed to be a registered teacher and put the teaching profess profession in disrepute. Therefore, I could not teach in a school. I could have fought the decision, but by this stage, I had had enough of bureaucracy and decided that if it wasn't obvious that I had acted in what I still believe to be the best interest of a young woman who was trying to avoid a coerced marriage, and during the whole investigation, I was not even given the courtesy of being spoken to in person rather than just by email, then the teaching registration board was not worth my time and I just wanted to move on. Clearly, we didn't see eye to eye about what danger looked like and what constituted genuine care of student well-being. Fast forward two years, I have recently released a young adult novella loosed basically on this true story in a pen name to coincide with International Women's Day. I'm hoping that it will eventually make its way into schools as a set text and become a conversation starter in raising awareness of the practice of coerced marriage. I love that. And the book is called Sacrifice by P.T. Sad. And Sad is spelled S-A-A-D. And uh, I absolutely love this story. What a horrific way to have been treated. And I'm so glad that you have turned this into a positive. Like that feels like a huge rebellion to me uh, to turn what has been a horrendous few years for you and uh, an awful situation into something positive. And I really, really hope that um, you do manage to get that book into schools because I think that it's really important and I think that a lot of people will, um, you know, ap appreciate and feel seen and heard in your book. So I love that. Thank you so much. Uh, 
If you would like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rebellion, something big, something small, or something in between. You can email your rebel story to Becca over on rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com. Welcome and a huge thank you to Tay. I really appreciate you joining my Patreon. Um, And of course, a gigantic thank you to all of the show's existing patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, as well as bonus content like the movie night that we had last night, or the uh, quarterly two-hour-long Rebel Patreon masterclasses this next time we're doing found family then you can from as little as two dollars a month by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. Okay that's it from me let's get on with the episode. Hello and welcome to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I'm joined by Katia from Midblatt. Katia is an account manager for Midblatt, a book cover design company. She's into art, outdoor activities and personal growth. Katia is from Ukraine, but currently living in the sunny city of Istanbul in Turkey. She's also lived in the USA and China. Miblat are a Ukrainian company, and Katia joined about a year ago. Miblat help self-publishing authors and publishers to create top-notch book covers that are not only visually appealing, but are also highly effective as marketing tools. They also provide logos, marketing, graphics, and interior formatting services. With zero deposit required, unlimited revisions, and guaranteed refunds, you can never go wrong with Midblatt. Katia loves her job as an account manager there. She gets to meet many creative people from all around the world and share her knowledge on book cover designing. Hello and welcome. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sasha. It's so nice to be here today. So before we go into the topic of using your book cover as a marketing tool, can you tell everyone a little bit about your journey? How did you end up working for Miblart? Uh, How, yeah, what is kind of your background? Do you write? What do you read? Like, tell everyone all of the things. Of course. So as you mentioned, I'm kind of a new blood at Mabel Arts family, but I love it. I was introduced there by Julia, actually, who came to your podcast a year ago. Uh, my journey started, I guess, um, when I was studying in China. I had a bachelor, I have a bachelor degree in uh, business administration, but I always had hobby uh, graphic design as my hobby. So being an account manager at a book cover design company is kind of my perfect job, I guess, because it's both my major and my biggest hobby. Um, Actually, I would say maybe everything started a while ago when I was a child. It's like a little funny story from my childhood. My mom decided to do an experiment. She placed different objects on the floor, such as money, toy, candies, um, makeup, car keys, and a book. And she wanted to see which object will I reach out to first. So guess what? The book was the object Uh... I picked up. So I guess maybe working in a design, a book cover design company was my destiny from the childhood. And what kind of things do you read? What genre do you read? I like reading nonfiction a lot. Um, yeah, I would say nonfiction mostly. And is that and kind also, of in the art space or what sort of topics do you read? I like reading about psychology. Oh. And uh, also maybe a bit of history, but like um, not so complicated so I can understand it because I, I'm i not so good at science, but reading nonfiction helps to understand important concepts. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, definitely. Of, of, mm-hmm. So are you reading in English? Yes, I'm trying to read in English and some Ukrainian as well. That's amazing. I'm always so impressed when uh, non-native speaking, uh, non-English, non-native English speaking people read in English. I just, I'm so in awe because I'm I'm not like, I can, I do good English, (laughs) but I I cannot speak any other languages. And I mean, I can do little bits and bobs, but, you know, I always find it so impressive. What led you to China? Because that's quite a shift. And also, you know, that English or or Ukrainian, I don't know how many languages you speak, but do you you speak like Mandarin or Cantonese or? Uh, um, Indian, Indian, a little bit. (laughs) Not too much. My Chinese is pretty elementary, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, I was an exchange student in the United States 
And there I had the chance to choose um, courses in my in my high school. So I decided to learn Chinese and I got really interested in Chinese culture. And then I started to look for opportunities to actually go to China and stay there for a while. Everybody, everybody from Ukraine was surprised because they thought, okay, if she went to United States as an exchange student, maybe she will want to go back there. But I said, nope, I'm going a different direction. <laughs> That's amazing. What was your, like most favorite part of China because that's one country I'm like I've always wanted to visit I love its nature like the parks there are so amazing and people take a good care of nature mm-hmm. this is what they like um, not animals I would say they don't care about animals as we do for example but in terms of plants it's really relaxing when you go to the park you listen to birds singing and I also love the language, music, and their culture in general. Oh, that's amazing. I love it. I, I like the whole of Asia fascinates me. I've I've been to Nepal, but um never to China. And, and Japan is number one on my bucket list. So it's like that part of the world fascinates me. And I would love like the opportunity to spend some more time there. But maybe I'm still young. There's plenty of time. Um Okay, so we are going to talk about uh, book covers and using your book cover as a marketing tool. But first of all, can you tell me a little bit about how an author should conduct market research on a book cover? Like, what is it we should look for? Is, you know, and what kind of information should they take to their designer? Okay, so uh, first of all, the most important thing is that you never stop learning. And uh, you need to see what covers out there already, what other authors are doing and analyze, always analyze, like what works well, what doesn't work well, what do you prefer, for example. And uh, the the most important is always uh, follow your competitors, like people of the same genre or category and see what they are doing. And uh, also follow the trends, uh, follow... uh, Check like the ba- the most basic advice is to check Amazon for best selling books, and try to understand why they're there, what makes them look good, and why people buy those books. And it, it's a hard work, I know, and it takes it takes years to master. Um, but it's more important to build your vision by looking and analyzing uh, lots of different covers. And uh, when the author wants to uh, hire a book, a book graphic designer, uh, cover designer, sorry, uh, cover designers, they also do this kind of research. It's just they do it for um, like for longer and probably for different genres. And they learn from uh, their mistakes, mistakes of, art, of others. Uh, so when authors uh, come to designer, they should state what genre they have, what category, what maybe even introduce some competitors. Like I have this friend who writes same kind of books and please can like here are some examples and uh, then designer can analyze. Um, also, it's important to uh, be like um, being being able to identify things which other authors do, some cool things, for example, and uh, make notes uh, what things you find appealing and what things you don't like for your own uh, works. Um, and yes, when they come to this, uh, to commission the cover from the designer, they should describe uh, their book in details. It's mo- most important is to complete the creative brief really well. Like, don't neglect questions within creative brief. Uh, put as much detail details as possible. References your preferences. Um, describe some key key elements of your story. Um, and uh, yes, that's basically it for that part okay so when they're looking on amazon and they're comparing book covers and they're looking at the best-selling category what is it they should look at so what elements in the book covers should they be comparing like what is it that makes a genre book cover so to speak like what is it that makes them all similar that they should be looking for um they need to see uh the similarities genres have of of course, they can read some theory on the internet before uh, designing the cover. They do it themselves, so they go to the designer. Uh, but they need to um, understand what are some genre standards and go from there. 
because uh, if they don't have this genre relation in their book cover, like relation to their genre, then they can they have a huge chance of um, missing the, the, uh, w what their target audience want. And if they don't satisfy their target audience, then they don't uh, sell books. This is the most um, sad thing that, that can happen. So the things so, that no, they would mm -hmm. like want to look for would be like, for example, if there are people on the covers versus having symbols on the covers or uh, like in crime, for example, there's often like a moody landscape, like with a lot of crime books at the moment. So are those the kinds of things or should they be looking at fonts? Should they be looking at colours? Like what are the important factors to get right? Um, I would say everything because it just goes for analyzing. Because if you want to analyze the trend, then you would look at what kind of covers are there. Like are there object covers or character covers? But if you want to learn about genre, then you need uh, this um, um, pay attention to colors, to fonts, because these things, they don't change that fast as trends. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's important to identify what's your goal. Like what are you trying to learn here? Trends or genre standards? Okay, and maybe we can go into a little bit more detail about that because, you know, authors here time and again, you need your book to look like it belongs to that genre. But what does that like really mean? What what does having an on genre book mean when we are also given the advice to have covers that stand out? How can you have a cover that look that looks part of a genre and stand out? Uh, so first of all. Uh, a book cover has to relate to the genre because it sets certain expectations for the potential, potential reader. The reader goes to, let's say, Amazon, scrolls, your, uh, scrolls the books, and then if they see the book is not really related to other books, they might think that they, there's some problem with the website or something, like why this book is here. So it can set wrong expectations, so the reader will not even want to take a look at your book because the most important thing that front cover can do is to attract attention that the person will uh, get interested enough to read the blur and then maybe a sample or something else um you need to like the book cover has to um um provoke the thought of a potential reader that it's something i would read uh, so they will be not lost connection with the audience. It's very important. Uh, for example, I was on Reddit a couple of uh, days ago and I saw this post uh, of a book cover and the guy was saying, uh, this is the moment when people judge the book by the cover. I shared this book, which was, I think it was psychological thriller, with but with some really um, dark, moody colors. And he said, I... I suggested to my friend to read this book, but he said, I don't want because it seems too scary for me. And so what we have, the potential reader is lost. And of course, uh, sale is not made. So it's um, not a good thing you want. Another thing is um, people, tr like authors really want to stand out and they sometimes can um, trying to invent, like reinvent the wheel but it's not a really good direction to go because to stand out from the crowd, you first need to be in the crowd and then uh, think of something. How can you become noticeable from the crowd? Um, so I would say that uh, genre standards, they're not, they're not supposed to be confused with cliches and um, we shouldn't criticize cliche because actually cliches, they sell books. Uh, so it's a good base. So from here, the authors can um, analyze like why there are so many cliches and then they need to think how can they improve it? What's some interesting things they can add? For example, okay, we have hundreds of books with uh, topless men, let's say. What can I do something interesting with this topless man? Like maybe some angle or I don't know, try some other color palette, contrast. Uh, contrast is very important, by the way. And this way, you are on genre, you hit your target audience, and then it. But then you are still different from others. 
because uh, front cover has to doesn't have to tell the story like the whole story. It has to hint. It has to like be like marketable as the topic of this podcast. Like buy me, I'm interesting. Like open me, <laughs> and it has to give the right associations, like um, which you said. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of my favorite things about physical bookstores is that you can walk into a store and scan like the shop and you'll know exactly where you're supposed to go because all of the books that you read look the same and it has kind of that like feel in that corner of the bookstore really bugs me like I have a a, 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 a couple of local bookstores that I go to whenever they move stuff around I'm always like <gasps> Like, how dare they? I know my corner. I know which corner I go to. And then, like, yeah, my, my uh, Waterstone said that recently. I was like, oh, it's not the same. I always go to that corner. Uh, anyway. Um, okay. What are some, and actually, this is, a, this is a great question for me right now because I'm just about to do this, but what are some really great ways to do a, an effective hover reveal that helps you, like, with marketing? I will not give any like 100% tested way of doing the cover reveal because it's all it's all um, unique. Every case is unique, and it's just the um, creative freedom for every author how to do a cover reveal. But I can give some ideas on that. The most important is to remember that you need to um, get get readers intrigued, and this is like you need to tease more like uh, I will show you something amazing like just wait for it you need to be like a showman here um, to, um, to to draw this interest and this is the great content opportunity for the authors uh, because you can uh, post a lot uh, about discover reveal and the most imp- also important thing is make it a huge event like of course like we know that cover reveal um Maybe it's not some, some, so important for some people, but you need to make it important like with your attitude to show that this is something huge and every, everyone wants to see it. Um, as for social medias, it's, um, it's a good idea to maybe do a Q&A session and uh, before that um, announce that event so people will come. Um, some people do countdowns. Like it's five days before cover reveal, four days, and maybe uh, show some fragments of a book cover, like different kind of puzzles. Um, and some people also do like some character art uh, for attracting um, for the book cover, like sneak peek of the cover, a snippet of the book, uh, the back blurb, um, be- or show some behind scenes if you have some sketch, for example. Like, who, look how amazing it will turn out. Um, and maybe maybe if you have some interesting story, how, like, on your ideas behind the book cover, it's also great to share. And um, book cover animations were good for Insta stories. I don't know why not so many authors have them, but uh, I think um, Instagram wants us to post more reels and more videos, so it's uh, nice to have this kind of a video and uh, for a website it's important to announce cover reveal in your newsletter if you already have some audience then these people are already excited about your work so seeing a new your new book cover for them it's especially a holiday let's say like a party um and um, it's important to also um, put your book, book uh, on the website afterwards and update your uh website header and maybe you can um, do some pop-ups like if the person goes to your website they get this message that uh there has been recently a cover reveal like check out my book and uh, some people prefer doing book trailers um another thing the most maybe one of the most important ones is always ask others to help like um hey, I'm going to have this uh, book cover out soon. Can you please repost this post or can I post in your group? So community can help and repost. Um, yeah, so my my last point, I already said it, but make this event huge, like create this kind of a mood for everyone. 
Yeah, I love that. And I definitely uh, think that there is a huge lot that can be said about just the author being enthusiastic. Like I think a lot of us are often afraid to show like our passion and our enthusiasm and our pride in the work that we we create because we, I don't know, I just think it's something about creatives. Like we don't want to shout about the things that we've done, but actually um, enthusiasm is contagious. Like it, it's literally a virus. So the more enthusiastic you are, the more enthusiastic other people will be. And that was like a really hard lesson for me to learn. <laughs> But I did learn that over the last year. And now I am thankfully in love with what I'm doing. And therefore, it's very easy to be enthusiastic um, about about the book. So, yeah, thank you for that. Yes, t- totally, totally. And also, like you need, as you said, you need to be proud of yourself mm-hmm. and uh, praise yourself for that. Because even if you, designer did it for you, like the cover for you, you still need to be proud of yourself because it's your book. And now this book has a cover, like it's such a great event and you need to share your happiness with the world and scream about it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, other than not adhering to, to genre conventions, what mistakes should an author avoid with their book cover? Another thing uh, to avoid is uh, not giving a target audience what they want because authors need to understand that if they want their book to sell, they are like entrepreneurs and they need to think um, their readers in terms of uh, like their customers because they are going to pay money for your book. So it's uh, important to uh, know your target audience well, do some research, uh, talk to them as well. And uh, that way you can guarantee that uh, your book can bring sales. Um, also, it's important to collect feedback because um, some authors might think that, okay, I came up with this great idea. I don't need to ask anyone. I will just do it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> this way can be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so it's a good idea to share it with your friends. Um in some communities on the on social media, there are great Facebook groups. You can just show your cover and ask if they like. What do you think about my cover? What should I improve? And uh, if designer does this work, they can just uh, return to designer and um, share their feedback. But um, another side of this is when people ask um, feedback in wrong places. For example, if an experienced designer does the work and then this person asks somebody who is just criticized everything on the internet, they don't like every, anything, and then they say some bad things about this book cover, even though they don't have any experience, any like expertise in this question. And this person, the author thinks, okay, maybe he is right. I will go back to designer and say this, this book cover doesn't work, which is also not a good uh, strategy. Um, it's good to get feedback from like with people with good expertise or uh, many, many friends. Um, other things, uh, of course, I can't mention that uh, designing your own book cover can be uh, crucial if you if the author doesn't have um, graphic design background or no like understanding of how this industry works. Um, of course, if this is a hobby, they can try and learn. It's not a problem. But the, if they want their cover to make sales, it's important to invest time, invest uh, money. So the book will bring uh, money as well, bring it back. Um, some other things would more be concerned about the like, parts of a graphic design. So I will not go in, in deep with these uh, topics, but uh if the author designs cover by themselves, um, they shouldn't use low quality images and um, also no license rules and uh, some maybe do some research on uh, color theory and as we talked about genre, what, what are some genre standards and uh, not, not underlooking typography because it's also crucial. Some authors might think that just a picture with some text on it, it's uh, going to be all right. But typography is also a very crucial element of a cover. It should uh, be eye-catching. It should uh, be well composed and blend in with the background as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I've had two covers uh, with Mibla and I've loved both of them. 
the uh, the first one was the Rebel Diaries. Um, and that was fantastic. It was a super great service. And then the recently, my first book in the new series that I'm writing, A Game of Hearts and Heist, was with a separate um, company. And then um, I couldn't get the book cover as quick as I needed. So I sort of begged Mibla and they delivered bang on time. And for the first time, I think ever, I mean, obviously they had the uh, original uh, book in the series, but for the first time ever I literally did not have a single change and I couldn't I couldn't believe it you guys got it bang on um yeah I mean it's literally unheard of I've never ever in all my days known anybody not to have a single change on a cover but that was it (laughs) we got it straight away so well done well done you guys you you definitely know your shit (laughs) Um, Okay, so one of my patrons, Heather, says, how would you go about rebranding a series? Like, what would the first steps be? Um, The first step would be uh, analyzing what didn't work out with your previous branding strategy. Uh, You need to identify mistakes and also, as as I said before, ask feedback, as much feedback as possible. And if there is an option to get consultation with the designer is also very good. Or even not a designer, but a person who works in a book cover design industry because they know a lot about it. And um, give information to the designer of uh, what kind, like what is your, if you have a thing, what is your thing? What is like theme of your books? And um give designer an understanding what kind of goal you want to achieve with your branding because it's all like every uh, case is unique so it will all, all depend on the case um, the most important um, figure would be a sales number so com- just compare with your previous uh, branding strategy what were the sales numbers and after you do rebranding check like what changed if something changed or what didn't change? And then um, after after this, if uh, the author receives some negative feedback, they shouldn't neglect this feedback. On this stage, it's very important to, again, analyze. I say this word again throughout the podcast, analyze everything and learn from this. And um, because sometimes uh, an author can have a different taste other than the audience's. So let's say an author is a, I don't know, like metal hat, loves everything dark and black, but they write some rom-com, let's say. And it's not uh, suitable for rom- rom-coms, rom-coms to have really dark covers. So people will like be misled. misled. And um, another important thing is to look at some famous series and... Um, see what kind of design choices uh, they are and uh, what things unite books in the series. Because the most important for the series uh, is uh, that the books looks unite. If you pick up one book, uh, the reader is uh, intrigued about the other ones because he can instantly know that this book is part of the series. And if I love this book, I will get more books. Um, when, I was, uh, when I was in middle school, I had books about Sherlock Holmes and I mean, the front cover didn't have anything like no images, nothing, just the name of the author and the name of the book. But if you uh, put them on the bookshelf, you could see like the silhouette of Sherlock Holmes. And I, as a child, I thought it was so cool. I need to have all these books to make this image on my bookshelf. That is a genius bit of uh, marketing there. (laughs) I really liked what you said about, um, your opinion and your preferences as an author not necessarily matching the genre and that's something that I have experienced because I don't particularly like people on covers um but in fantasy they the the trend does change and it swings between having people on the cover and having symbols on the cover and uh so it's really important that you do check what is trending because you're only gonna um like cut your nose off to spite your face or whatever the phrase is um you will shoot shoot yourself in the foot if you do not adhere to what is selling right now 
Um, one of the good ways to look at that, um, Alex Newton from the Kalytics company has great reports um, on what is trending. Um, and and depending on uh, and they're really cheap as well. Like they're less than 40 bucks. So um, I always get those. And that's, that's just for listeners. It's a great way to check because he does all the analysis for you um, and pulls a lot of the covers and shows you what's selling versus like what the majority of the covers are. So that's really interesting um, a sort of bit of data that somebody else that crunches the numbers for you. Um, uh, uh, so can I add something? Yeah. Sorry. It's so good that you mentioned this uh, thing, having people on the cover, because I saw so many memes that people say something, oh, if there are characters on the cover, will not, I will never buy it because, and some reasons, like, I don't know. <laughs> but as for me, if I go to the bookstore, I love seeing uh, some uh, character art on the front cover. So it really attracts me. So it all depends on your target audience preferences again. Like, and how would you make a book cover, like a romance book cover without people on them, for example, then on in, with this genre, it doesn't, like, this rule doesn't work because when you have characters on the cover, it helps target uh, audience to like relate to the characters sometimes and it transfers emotions, the mood uh, through your character expression on the cover because um, yeah, like if their eyes on the cover, for example, uh, it translates uh, all these emotions that you want to get, like, uh, get from your readers. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because I love character art. I just don't like it on the cover. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, like, I love seeing it. Um, but, yeah, I just, I, I, I tend not to I'll I'll read books with people on the front if they're in KU but I don't tend to purchase them for my shelf if that makes sense because I think they're prettier when it's not people on clearly I just don't like people <laughs> um anyway okay on to branding what are the important elements of a cover that should adhere to an author's brand how how can an author make sure that there's a like a brand feel across their whole series, not just one individual book? And maybe maybe that question also for like when they're an author who's written multiple series, so not just one series. How do you get a brand feel across across your your work? Um, at first, the author has to set the goals for the designer, especially what they want um these cases are also all can be different maybe a lot of wants to be recognizable throughout all his books in his career or maybe another author wants to get recognizable from one series only and then he wants to ex uh, they want to experiment with some styles or they write in different genres so of course you cannot apply this rule to um, if there are different genres let's say but uh, if they do want it, uh, this branding throughout the whole series, they need to state this uh, when they um, talk with the designer. They want to, um, because desi designer, if they know the author's goal, it's uh, they can suggest uh, some, um, some creative design choices that the author can use. Um, so... Yeah, designers can also suggest uh, maybe to have a thing of an author or maybe the author says, I have a thing already, I want to use it. And um, yeah, the most important is um, like give a detailed explanation of what you want. And then you will get suggestions, suggestions from the designer. It can be uh, maybe some uh, some design choice throughout the whole books like typography which the author can use uh, not only on the books but on other marketing uh, tools or on their website uh, maybe um, a certain layout choice as well because uh, it's not always title in the on top or in the in the bottom it can like designer can play with it and suggest different things what's uh, more important accurately representing the content of the book or accurately representing the genre, the kind of vibes, the feel of the story? Like what, what should an author focus on? Because I often hear them asking or, or saying, well, 
I want my cover to, you know, accurately represent the story? But the answer is totally the book cover should um, represent the genre, vibe, and feel of the story, as you said. Because actually, over-designing is a big no for any author out there. You, the, the front cover doesn't exist to tell the story. Your, your story is like your, your book is. Front cover is just like a wrap candy. It just needs to attract uh, people who will read your book. So it it shouldn't be too complicated with different elements. Um, to support my statement, there are some abstract covers or typography-based covers, which totally don't give any uh, like relation to the story. But because of how they look, they are they are gender related and they kind of convey this theme of a book, they work well and they sell they sell the book. Okay, well, this is the Rebel Author Podcast. So tell everyone about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. In general, I would say I am not that, I don't know, rebellious, but sometimes I make choices that I look back and I think like, what did I think of? How did I come to this? Um, a year ago, before uh, the war in Ukraine happened, nobody was nobody believed that it would uh, happen, and um, nobody even was even talking about it. So I went to meet my to visit my friend in the west of Ukraine. I packed uh, a medium sized backpack, um, and there I was getting so many messages from people from abroad, and they all were saying like. They show Ukraine in the news, what's going on, are you safe, can you please go somewhere um, so you stay safe. And there I thought, okay, I don't feel safe now, like I kind of worried. So I messaged my friend who lives, who owns apartment in Turkey, and I said, hi David, can I come to visit soon, like very soon, tomorrow maybe? (laughs) And he thought it was super weird, but he said, like, okay, whatever, like, come, sure. And I didn't go back to my rented apartment in Kiev. I just went to the airport. I bought a very expensive ticket to come to Turkey. I went to airport. And I've been staying here since then. <laughs> I started to build my life abroad with only one backpack of clothes for three days. Um, but I am really, really happy. I made this decision back there. Wow! So have you have you ever been home to get your stuff, or have you not been back? Nope i I went to Ukraine once. Okay. Just because I really missed my mom, so I told her to come to Western Ukraine because it's like the safest area, mm-hmm. and she, she was so happy. She was crying and stuff. But uh, yeah, I didn't uh, go back to my apartment in Kiev. I just, I have an uncle in Kiev, so he picked up my stuff and sent it to my mom and stuff. So it's all good. But yeah, I wow, had to buy that. a lot of things. Yeah, wow. That's incredible though. What a what a journey. And I'm sure your mom is incredibly um, pleased that you're safe and in a in a in a safe space as well. Um that is that is one hell of a rebellion. And I love that you just upped and left and was like, okay, I'm going. Yeah, it's an incredible story. Okay. Tell everyone where they can find out more about Miblot, their services, um, and anything else that you would like to add. As for Mibelart, just go to mibelart.com and there you can find our portfolio, services description, or if you need more information, just uh, use the form at contact us and our project manager will um, answer. But I would really love to connect with everyone on social media. So find me on Facebook or Instagram as Katya Balab. Balab is like my shortened version of my surname because my surname is longer. So Katya Balab. And uh, yeah, hit me a message. Let me know if you like this podcast or maybe you, it was a waste of time. Just let me know as well. Like either feedback is accepted. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, fantastic. And I will make sure all of those links are in the show notes as well so people can reach out. 
Thank, thank you. you so much for your time today. And of course, a giant thank you to all of the show's listeners and all of the show's patrons. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, then you can do so by visiting patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. I'm Sasha Black. You were listening to Katia from Miblot, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week on the podcast, we have got a long-awaited guest who you have all asked me for a number of times. So next week, I will be talking to Claire H. Taylor all about the Enneagram, all about writing, and let me put it this way. There are a few uh, personal discoveries about my Enneagram type, and uh, we have a giggle. Let me put it that way. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to Claire, so I'm super excited for you guys uh, to hear that interview next week. This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. 